shadows deepen But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave.
this morning? I need to hear you sing that a little bit louder.
Amen. Do you guys believe it? I believe that you believe it. Stand with me if you would. We're going to read out of Matthew chapter 2 due to lengthy scripture. We're going to pray, then I'll have you set back down. You guys feeling it this morning? I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord is in the house. Father, our hearts are bowed to you. We pray that you would illuminate our hearts with your scripture. Let us know more coming in, God, and let us know more going out than we did yesterday. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness, and everyone says... Amen, amen. You may be seated. Just because we love to do it, wave at your neighbor and let them know that you're glad, especially if it's your spouse, that's always a good thing. Well, welcome on this Palm Sunday as we start our new series, Victory. You know, one thing about victory is victory doesn't always look like we think victory should look, does it? It's kind of a weird thing sometimes. Many times we have victory in our mind pinned as one thing, but whenever God begins to move in our life, the victory that he wants to bring doesn't look like the victory that I think it should look like. Does anybody else have that issue sometimes? And today we get to study that. Today as we read out of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we see that victory came from a donkey ride. Let's begin. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of, the, of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, um, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We can certainly join in that this morning, can't we? And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is one of those pivotal moments in history. As we walk forward here this next week, it's what we like to refer to as Holy Week. It's the week that we set aside because we're celebrating Easter, our risen Savior. Amen? So we're going to do things this next week, and that's what I want to challenge you with this morning, is how can we do things next week to prepare our hearts for Sunday, for Easter. And there's nothing wrong with having fun. There's nothing wrong with Easter bunnies and eggs. And I enjoyed watching Callie hunt Easter eggs when she was younger. And we went out and did a fishing thing at Lake, uh, at Duncan Lake yesterday, cast for kids and, and special needs kids from all of the community showed up. And we did an uh, Easter egg hunt after it. And I'm telling you, there's just something fun seeing a bunch of kids go get those eggs, right? 20,000 of them next Saturday. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We want you to be here. But we know as Christians, that's not our focus, amen? That's just simply not. It's our risen Savior. And as we read this story, we want to look into it and, and understand how important it is. It's in all four Gospels. Matthew wrote, wrote about it, and Mark wrote about it, and Luke wrote about it, and John wrote about it. So it's something that we want to look at, but what we begin to see is victory doesn't look like we think victory looks like. I mean, of all the things you're riding in on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey, Back in this day, men uh, of power, people who led communities and, and nations would come in, and if they wanted to, to take territory, they'd come in on like a white steed or, or animals that represented authority. Not so much a donkey. They would ride in, and how their, they, they would ride in, and their pomp and circumstance would let people understand that they meant business, that they came. They came to bring war, or they came to assert their authority. But in this case, this is not what happens. Jesus rides in on the colt of a donkey, and we wonder why. Well, it simply means that he was there for peace. He wasn't there to assert his authority. That will come much later. And it will happen. So we look in this story, and we see all kinds of amazing things. One of the things that I wonder about as I was reading this story, as I was going over it this last week, how many of you guys have ever ridden a donkey? All right, we got some brave people. Some people, I ain't, I ain't never done that before. Even if I have, I'm keeping my hand down because it's weird. So I've ridden a donkey once in a basketball game. That's a story for a different day, okay? 
But I had the opportunity to be on a homemade cart that was pulled by, I believe, two donkeys. In the neighborhood that I lived in, before I live in the one now, there was a gentleman that would always be out walking his donkeys. And one day I was walking to my house and I was about probably 200 yards away or so away from my house. And he pulls up beside me and his little cart and the two donkeys. And he's like, Matt, do you want to ride? I was thinking, I sure do want to ride. No, I really didn't want to be rude, but I was excited also because I'd never been on a cart. Now, hindsight's twenty twenty. He rolls up beside me on a homemade cart. I mean, we're talking this piece of wood on a couple bicycle tires. You know what I mean? Like, I just didn't <laughs> fully think this through, maybe. Anyways, so I said, sure. So I hop up there, and of course, I'm wide-shouldered, and he was kind of wide-shouldered, so we kind of looked awkward on this little bitty deal anyways. And we take off, and let me tell you guys, the first 7,500 yards was amazing. The donkeys walk straight forward, and I'm just like, ah, like Miss America, you know what I mean? It's awesome. Then all of a sudden, things change. The donkeys begin to do what donkeys want to do and not what the person is telling them to do to do. And all of a sudden, we're going great. Then all of a sudden, they start veering left. And before it's all over with, we're piled up in a fence, and we've ran over a stop sign, and, and he's, he's mushing them, you know, doing the thing, you know, you know get on, don't, saying things that I can't say, you know, and I'm on this thing thinking, I'm going to die. This is how it's going to end, 100 yards from my house. Could you imagine that? Oh, Matt was a good man, loved Jesus, just couldn't make it through the two donkeys. Let's pray. That's really not the eulogy, you know what I mean? So we're doing this, and finally I look at him. I said, man, I'm, I think I'm going to get off this thing and just walk the rest of the 100 yards home. He goes, are you sure? I said, yes, I am quite sure. I appreciate it. And then I got off and go home. But I was thinking about that scenario, and I was thinking about how crazy it was, and then Christ rides on the donkey, the colt of a donkey, and it just proves that he has power over all creation. It is submitted to him. So he rides in in peace, And as I began to look at this story, I began to pull some things out that I really think can challenge us next week, but we can also add them to our everyday lives. As we've just read this story, one of the things that pops out to me is this, that Scripture always champions people's opinion. As I read this story, I see that Scripture always champions people's opinion. In Matthew chapter 16, Verse 13 and 14, we see that Christ is talking to some of his disciples and and opinions have been around as long as people have been around. And he asks this question, he says, what do people say the Son of Man is? He's asking his disciples, he goes, I know y'all been hearing some stuff about who people think I am. What, what, What have they been saying? Now Christ knew this, but they go on and they say, and some say that you're John the Baptist and others say that you're Elijah and others Jeremiah and, 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 or one of the prophets. And they go down this list and they tell him all the opinions of people. But how many of us know it doesn't matter about the opinions of people, it matters what Scripture says, amen? The authority is in the Scripture. Now, but opinions have been around. So I want to pull in some contemporary opinions. Here's what Napoleon Bonaparte has to say about God. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Pretty interesting hearing from one of the greatest generals to ever live. John Lennon, the great musician, artist, peace activist. I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. Well, I guess we can agree upon that. I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just the translations have gone wrong. Unfortunately, I wonder how many people were inspired by that. Gandhi says this, a man who has completely, or excuse me, a man who was completely innocent offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. Still not ever knowing whether Muhammad Gandhi, he said that, but really not ever knowing if he truly submitted his life to Christ. It's not just enough to know, you got to do. And finally, we can't leave out one of the great philosophers, Brad Pitt, bring in Hollywood here I didn't understand this ideal of God who says you have to acknowledge me 
You have to say that I'm the best and I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to be about ego, and I can't see God operating from ego, so it made, me, so it made no sense to me. And that was actually from an interview why Brad Pitt turned away from religion in 07. So opinions have been around forever. And there's nothing wrong with opinions. We should have opinions. We live in America. But unfortunately, opinions are kind of like armpits. Everybody has them, and they stink from time to time. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with it. But opinion does not trump Scripture, does it? It doesn't matter how many towers you own. It doesn't trump Scripture. Scripture is what should govern our lives. Amen? It's not something that we just say. It doesn't matter if somebody believes it or not. It doesn't matter whether somebody's excited about it or not or accepts it. Or accepts it. Scripture is true, pure and pure, and we should govern our lives by it. So it gets me excited when I look into this passage found in Matthew 21 and also John chapter 12. They quote this, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, written 500 years before this event. God already knew that it was going to happen. Christ rides in in the triumphal entry. Why? Because God said that it was going to happen, and it was going to happen. It didn't matter whether man wanted it to happen, the leaders of Israel wanted it to happen. God said it, therefore it happened. Amen? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you identifies him as king righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey so whenever we look at that we see that scripture trumps man's opinion it champions man's opinion so we realize as we read into revelation chapter 19 and one day jesus christ is going to return and this day, in that time, it won't be on a donkey. It won't be to, to have peace, amen? He's going to come back on a white horse, and he's going to have fire in his eyes, and he's going to mean business, and he will crush those that are his enemies. He will make them his footstool. Not because we said, not because we want it to happen, or we don't want it to happen. It's because all authority is contained in Scripture. So we look at it. And we know that what God has set in motion that man cannot maneuver through, or excuse me, get out of the way of. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14, And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. It's interesting as I read that scripture because I begin to realize that as children of the Most High God, being a part of those armies, we're not there because Christ needs help, amen? He can handle it himself. We're there as a front row seat, and we're going to do whatever we're told to do, but we'll have a front row seat to see how all authority and all power is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this time he rides in on a donkey, and he's creating peace, and he's doing what he can to set up the kingdom in the hearts and the minds of man. But whenever he comes back, he will have fire in his eyes and be on that white horse, and people better be ready because he will bring vengeance and wrath, and that is his. It doesn't matter what man's opinion thinks. See, man, opinion is one of those hard, difficult things that we have to deal with because we see men. We see people who have something that maybe we would like to possess. Maybe influence or material possessions or whatever it might be. And what we can allow to happen is their, in, their, their opinion begin to influence us. But this is the thing. If it does not line up with Scripture, it cannot stand in my mind or in my actions or in my heart. Because Scripture always champions man's opinion. The Bible declares this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass wither and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. So I have to choose Scripture to govern my life, not man's opinion. Not the people in the crowd who were out there who didn't trust Christ, who didn't believe in Christ, who, who thought they knew another way. Even though the scripture was right there in front of them, their hearts were so hard. And how many people were influenced by their opinion, by what they thought? There's nothing wrong with people's opinion, but it doesn't govern our lives, does it? The word of God governs our lives. 
as we go into Holy Week, my challenge is this. Are you letting man's opinion influence you more than Scripture? My challenge is, what could you do this week to ratchet up that and allowing Scripture to influence you? Is it that devotion that you need to do? You need to sit down as an entire family every night and commit yourself. We're going to read through the triumphal entry. We're going to read through the crucifixion. We're going to read through the trial. And we're going to read through our Lord and Savior rising again. Sitting down with your family and saying, how do we make sure that, tr- that Scripture rules our hearts and our minds? As we think about that, it'll help us consider what I see next. I see that not only does Scripture trump people's opinion, does it champion people's opinion, but as I look into the text, I see that participating champions spectating. See, we're called in participating in the kingdom of God, amen? And here we see crowds again, and I don't want to act like I think that everybody in the crowd knew what they were doing. Some people were probably just caught up in the crowd, but we can't be naive enough to say that there wasn't many people in the crowd who knew what they were doing. They were grabbing palm branches and taking their cloaks and setting them on the road. They were taking their cloaks and putting them on the back of the donkey as the disciples went and got the donkeys. I mean, there's so many people that's participating in honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that's what we're called to do. But there were some on the outline, on the, on the fringe, that would just be spectators, that would keep Christ at arm's length. Their hearts were so hardened by their religion. Their hearts were so hardened by what they thought and not what Scripture said that they could not see that the answer that they had been hunting for for hundreds and hundreds of years was right before them, doing exactly what Scripture said. And all they were doing was spectating. You know, at my house, one of my favorite things to eat is potatoes. Does anybody like potatoes in here? Oh, yeah, that's our problem. We like potatoes and bread, huh? Meat, potatoes, and bread. Is there supposed to be anything else on the plate? I don't know. Sugar, yes, a piece of pie. Gotcha, gotcha. My bad. Growing up, we ate a trainload of potatoes, and we ate a trainload of hot dogs. Probably because there was four kids, and we could eat But I wasn't refined, as many of you guys are refined. We didn't always call them potatoes growing up. Sometimes we just called them taters. Did anybody else just call them taters? I like me some fried taters. Does anybody else? I like me a baked tater, and I really like a sweet tater. Now, not everybody likes sweet taters, but, boy, I like them whenever they're mashed out, and then you put pecans over them, melt some marshmallows on them. Oh, I don't know how healthy they are, but they, oh, them taters are good, man. We just love taters. Taters helps us out. But you know, there are some taters in our life that we don't really need. You know, one of the taters that I can't hardly stand is a commentator. (laughs) It kind of reminds me of a couch tater. (laughs) Want to look out and tell you kind of how to run everything and kind of how to do, but really don't have anything. How about an imitator? Ooh, I don't like posers, do y'all? We have a saying around here, you were born an original, don't die a copy. Don't be an imitator, be yourself. But there's another kind of tater that we need to talk about. And it's what we see in this story. It's a spectator. So we don't want to be a spectator. Spectating is a very dangerous thing because it makes you feel like you're a part of something that you're really not a part of. If you've been spectating at a football game or a basketball game or whatever it is and you're like oh man and you sweat and you yell and maybe even have some monetary investment but the truth is you really weren't down there on the field doing anything you know and this is the most difficult thing is you're going to leave that event and it's really not going to change your life one way or the other see being a spectator puts us in a place that kind of kind of fools us I was reading an article, and this gentleman was talking about surviving outdoors, and he says one of the most dangerous things as you're trying to survive outdoors is crossing rivers. Because you walk up to the river, and it looks like everything's calm and everything's okay. But whenever you begin to put one foot in it, and then the other foot, all of a sudden you begin to feel the current against you. But it looks okay, 
even makes you feel like you can get to the other side. I love to fly fish. I don't get to do it very often, but my wife and I really enjoy it. A couple years ago, we got to go to Colorado and fly fish. I had waders on that were, you know, waist high or higher, and it was the first time I'd ever been in one of those rivers. And the rivers weren't super wide, and it looked amazing. I mean, crystal clear water. You guys that have been there kind of know what I'm talking about. But it was a different story when I put those waders on and I actually got in the water. All of a sudden, that current was against my shins, and all of a sudden, I was beginning to have to sit there and hold myself still. But everything from the outside looked like it wasn't dangerous. It looked like it was okay. But it's not until I got in the water that I began to realize that looks can be deceiving. We went to Broken Bow and did the same thing. Had shoes on that time, and I walked out into the creek and to that little river that was flowing, and sure enough, same thing. All of a sudden, it looked amazing. Didn't look like it was that treacherous. Then all of a sudden, I got out there, and I began to feel that pressure. And my thought process was this. Man, if I slip on the rock, I'm going to be 100 yards down the river before I know what to do. See, being a spectator is the same way. It makes us feel like we're a part of something that we're really not. It's participating is what Christ wants us to be and wants us to do. It's getting down on the field and being a part of the team, and there's so many different opportunities to be a team. If you look down, you see the different phases and the different things that you can do. But you've got to participate. You've got to be a part of. It's like whenever we come into church and it's wonderful and, and we're in the presence of Christ. And how many of us want to be in the presence of Christ? Amen. But what we should desire even more is that the presence of Christ be in us. Because that will change us. See, my mind change happened when I stepped into the river and then I began to see the difference. It's not just about being in the presence of God, although we want to be there. It's that, Christ, I want your presence in me because I know that will change me and affect me the most. This is Paul on participating. He's writing to his son in the faith, Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Now, this is his first letter that we know of. But he talks to Timothy and he says, listen, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. And you gotta love what Paul is writing to Timothy because he's saying this, he's saying, Timothy, you are no longer a spectator. You're no longer that stands somebody that stands on the outside, but you are doing things for Christ. That means sometimes you gotta get on the boxing gloves and you're stepping in the ring, you're stepping on the field, you're doing what you need to do to fight this good fight of faith. And I love what he says. And he says, Timothy, Hold on to eternity. What was he saying? Listen, there's going to be a lot of good things that's going to make you want to lose your grip on Christ and reach out and grab for worldly things. But whatever you do, you don't let go of Jesus. It doesn't matter what it costs you in the world. You don't let go of Jesus Christ. Spectators don't have a hold of anything. Maybe a drink, a remote this is what Paul says as he writes again to his young son, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I love it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And you got to love Paul here because this is not one of those things where you imagine Paul's kind of like weak and kind of coming out and say, oh, Timothy. No, no, no. Paul was a fighter. He kept the faith. I mean, he was writing this or however he penned it or, or got it translated to Timothy. However it happened, you would have seen a man whose hands could have been crippled up from all the beatings that he had. He had wounds from shipwrecks and no doubt scars from snake bites. I mean, he had been there. He had fought. He was participating. He was not a spectator. So what he was writing to Timothy is saying, listen, Timothy, my life is about to be over. But son, yours in ministry is just beginning. And the thing that I wrote to you in the first letter, I want to let you know that I have lived that life and I stand proud on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, that I have fought and fought for the faith, that I have not let go of Christ. And Timothy, I want you to do the same thing. Participation. But if you do have to be a tater, be a sweet tater. Don't be an onion. Be a sweet tater. 
this next week? What could you do? The challenge is this next week with participation. What could you do? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Would you allow God to speak to you and see what he's calling you to? Something that you've already started that he wants you to go a little bit deeper in or maybe something that you have to start? Question, whether you're listening by camera or in the audience, if you're not saved, would you move from being a spectator to a participant? There's nothing more that Christ would like more. The third thing that I want to encourage us with this morning, the reason why that we can have courage as a participant is because we understand this as we look into the story, that relationship champions religion. Relationship champions religion. See, religion only shows what we should not do. Relationship with Jesus shows us what we can do. Religion shows us what we are against, but the relationship with Christ helps us find what we are for. Religion shows us how we'll never measure up. Relationship with Christ shows us how we can measure up. Religion concentrates on what we need to stop doing. Relationship with Christ concentrates on what we need to start doing. See, relationship is this living, breathing thing that whenever we walk in step with Christ and we go where he wants us to go and do what he wants us to do and we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, I mean, what an opportunity. It's not a slap in the face that the Spirit of the living God that dwells inside of us would convict us and steer our paths to the right so that we could honor God, that whenever we read the word of God, it jumps out and grips our heart, man. What an opportunity that we don't have to be destined for destruction, do we? But we look at it and we say, wow, I don't have to have a dead old dry religion. See, that was what was part of the problem. These leaders of Israel, they were, they were dead dry religion. That's Jesus' words. He says, you guys are like dead man's bones, man. You're in the cave out there and you're dry. Jesus said, that's not what we're here for. We're here for relationship. And as we look in this, we see that people were doing what they could because they were affected by Christ, because they saw him heal, they saw him touch, they saw him love. Yeah, they were pulling out palm branches and setting them on the road. They were taking their cloaks off. I mean, think about that. They were taking their cloaks off and putting them in the road. Hey, it wasn't like there's a TJ Maxx down the street. That might be the only cloak they have. And a donkey, one of the lowliest of animals, going to walk across it maybe even spread manure on it. But they understood something that was very important. They understood it wasn't about the donkey, it was about the one who rode the donkey. They understood about the relationship that we want to so desire. John chapter 15, verse 4, Christ teaches us about that. It says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Don't you just love how honest Christ is? Unless you abide in me, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. I love that. He doesn't give any room for not understanding. He said, listen, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. Pastor Mike and I talk about this all the time because our lives were meant to bear much fruit. Oh, dead, dry religion, that won't get you anywhere. But a thriving relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which is what he marched in Jerusalem for, will let you bear much fruit in your life. Amen. Not a bunch of to-do lists or things not to do or things that we should do, but a relationship with Jesus Christ that's not just stuck on numbers, that's not just stuck on woulda, shoulda, coulda, but man, we have Jesus Christ in our life in a relationship, and he reveals to me on a daily basis, speaks to my heart through a word, and you guys know what I mean, amen? The relationship. Not religion. Relationship. Christopher Reeve, the original Superman. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? He broke his back in a tragic horse riding accident. Many of you guys know that. This is what he said. He says, when the unthinkable happens, the lighthouse is hope. Once we find it, we must cling to it with absolute 
determination. Superman found something out that even he needed a little bit of hope from time to time. The difficulty, the reality of obstacles and difficulties is they can really stretch us. They come along and we try to get over them and we try to do what we need and man, they stretch us. But I want you to remember something. It's the wind that fills the kite that stretches it that causes it to rise. Don't let the stretching that's going on in your life, the obstacles that's going on in your life, keep you. God wants you to soar higher and higher, but it does require stretching. But this is the dilemma. If you're required to face those obstacles and stretch and difficulties time and time again by yourself, it leads to trauma. It leads to hopelessness. See, that's where everybody was at in the story. That's the reason why they were saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name, or blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Because they found hope for the first time in a long time. Something they couldn't find in dead, dry religion. Oh, but they found it in the relationship that they had with Jesus Christ. And it took some stretching. See, this is a story in a lot of ways for the common man. People who read scripture and say, if God said it, I'm gonna do it, and I believe it. It's the same thing that Superman found out that day that we all need a little bit of hope. We can't do it by ourselves. We find that true hope in the relationship with Jesus Christ. And my challenge is simply this. What could you do next week as we celebrate Holy Week to create even a stronger relationship with your Lord and Savior? And if you're not saved, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, start there. Come out of the stands, stop being a fan, and come on the field and be a participant with us. Don't be a spectator. God never designed us to be a spectator. He's got so much good for us, and like it says in Scripture, much fruit. And then when you get in those difficult positions, you stand on Scripture knowing that what Christ said, He means, it's written in the Word of God, and we can trust it. So as you recount this next week, as you prepare ourselves for Holy Week, and we prepare ourselves for Easter, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just move in your life, bring you to passages in Scripture that it will encourage you, inspire you. If you're in that difficulty, if you're in that circumstance, that you would be like that kite. And as that wind blows and it becomes hard, that you would hang on to scripture like a kite is on the stream and just begin to rise above it. Because God's your handler. We can trust him. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you for what you're doing this morning in the hearts and the seats and the lives of your people. I don't know everyone's situation, but I know that you do, and I know that it is important to you, the difficulties, the struggles, the obstacles that they face. And Father, for the one who is contemplating salvation, God, that they just embrace the wonderful things that you have for their life, that you've called them to. And they would move from being a spectator to a participant, giving their heart and their life to you. For my brothers and sisters who sit in the seat, you've been working on them, you've been encouraging them, you've been building things in their life. You've been stretching them a little bit at a time, but God, they're, they're beginning to soar. I pray that that would continue, that that would happen in an amazing way. Father, for somebody you've called to do something and they know that it's time to get out of the seat and get involved. Let them have the courage to do that. You're waiting on them. Would you stand up with me all across the auditorium? You've had time to think in your seats and I know that God does a lot of amazing things in seats. But I'm gonna ask you to be brave. Here in a second, we're going to have our altar team come down front, and they're going to want to pray with you. 
Maybe God is calling you to that place. Maybe you want to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Move from being a spectator to a participant. We want to welcome that here at Ray of Hope. But only you can make that move. I'm going to ask my altar team to come down if you guys would. And as they move from their seats, I want to go ahead and release you. I know that it's difficult and at times it's hard because people are looking. But trust me, they, have, they want great things for you. We want to give you time. We want to give you opportunity. What has Christ been speaking to you about? Would you bow with me as more feel free to move from their seats? Father, thank you for what you're doing in the seats and the people that are there, God, in the hearts and the lives. Thank you for what you're doing at the altar. But some of you that feel comfortable with praying, would y'all come down here and just lay a hand on a shoulder? Father, thank you for what you're doing. God, we want to be challenged by your word, challenged by what you're asking us to do. So our hearts are bowed. Let our spirits only be open to what you want to say to us, God. Thank you for the wonderful people that are praying together and what you're establishing in their lives and what you're doing, God. Father, for your saints in the room, let us be able to go into next week, God, with excitement and elation in our heart, knowing what you've done for us. Let us be challenged by Scripture. Let us be encouraged by your Spirit. Father, thank you for what you're accomplishing. God, we just pray that you have your way in this place. Father, thank you for what you've done in the seats. Thank you for what you're doing at the altars, God. We know that you're not through with us. So this next week, continue, God, to speak to us. Continue to let our hearts and our minds be open towards you and what you want to do. God, let us be the light that you've desired us to be. Let us celebrate Holy Week with awe and reverence. But God, knowing that you gave your life for us. Thank you for the wonderful opportunities. Thank you for the blessing, God. We're grateful for what you're doing, God, at the altar. Our hearts are bowed to you. We ask you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.